Good morning, everybody, and welcome to AFAPWA's second action circle cycle called Foundational Toolbox for Life. This is the first gathering in this cycle. Today is August 15th, 2020, and the moon is very close to a new moon, which will occur on August 19th. During this time of the moon cycle, we focus our attention on setting intentions, which is the beginning of our, the beginning of our cycle. August is back to school month, National Breastfeeding Month, National Eye Exam Month, National Immunization Awareness Month, and today is also known as Chant at the Moon Day and National Relaxation Day. So as, you, as we're going out there, they're gonna have a little sliver of a moon left. Feel free if you see it or not to chant at it and then engage in some relaxation, whatever that looks like for you. My name is Abigail Twyman. I am joining you today from the home I share with my husband, Dustin, and our dog, Ter Zeppelin, in the community of Nockety Bay. Our Alaskan oasis is located on northern Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska, which is located in Klinkitani, the land of the Klinkit people, which they also shared with the Haida and Simshian people, specifically in what is the ancestral homeland of the people of Tuxican or the Coast Town tribe. I'm honored to be able to share this space with my ancestors and the ancestors of those indigenous to the land I currently inhabit who fill my soul with a fire that fuels my action. I'm dedicated to remembering forward and passing along their immense wisdom for the benefit of future generations and protection of our shared home. I'm also deeply honored to be able to share this space with all the beautiful humans and change catalysts out there who have been inspired and empowered to join our pod and I'm dedicated to using this privileged body I was born into and this platform in the service of creating peace for <clears throat> um, creating peace. And I thank you all for joining us today and your, thank you for your commitment for creating peace for yourself, your family, your community, and all inhabitants of Mother Earth. We are honored today to have Alex Weisenfels guiding us through this cycle and I will pass it off to you, Alex. Let's see. In this case, this is where we do the, um, we set the intentions and then also we do the introductions, right? Yes, absolutely. And I forgot to mention that um, Depender, who, what, who is, who has been leading our guided meditations is not here today due to an illness in the family. So we will do, I will oh, okay. do, a, everything I works out, do right? a short guided meditation for us to kind of get us centered, unless we have another volunteer out there. Oh, okay, thank you. Let's see. Here we are, so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just make sure I've got the intentions here. Ah, here we are. I'm trying to sort out what um, what is part of every action circle and what's part of just this one action circle. So let me know if I leave anything out that we need here. Okay, you're good. Um, do we need to run through the, uh, the agreements first? Or is it something that we do after we set the intentions? Let's set the intentions and then we'll go through the, through the agreements. Uh, okay, let's see. And with the intentions, that also comes with the centerpiece, right? And with the intentions, um, that also comes with the centerpiece? Yes. I think you said yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. I have one of those right here. Let's see. Here we go. Um, okay, I can't share my screen. Uh, let's see, could you please let me share my screen so that I can share this picture here? I made let's you a co-host. Yeah, I made oh, you a co-host, so you should Ooh, be, have more controls now. Ah, uh, excellent, thank you. Let's see, here we go. Okay, and it's going to set this on slideshow. I can't pause it while I'm doing that. Never mind. I'll just pause it here. So this is the uh, the centerpiece. Just in general, there will be more pictures, but this is the um, 
kind of the theme here. Um, I I got this and all my other pictures from Pixabay, which is a great place to get uh, free images. Um, and this uh, found represents Ginunga Gap, which is uh, part of the, the old Norse creation myth, where back uh, a long time ago at the beginning of the universe, there was just a, a realm of ice, Niflheim, and a realm of fire, Muspelheim. And, and then this giant void, this abyss of emptiness in the middle called the Ginunga Gap. And over time, uh, the ice from Niflheim and the, the fire from Muspelheim just kind of diffused into the giant Ginunga Gap and mixed together. And through, um, through a rather convoluted process involving a giant cow, ended up creating the world as we know it. So the reason that I, I chose um, this as the theme for uh, not only the meeting, but just the ideas in general is because it's, well, it's essentially like the, the concept of yin and yang, but uh, that it's less cliche because not as many people know about it. And so people might be more inclined to, to actually think about what it means. The downside is it's harder to pronounce. But, uh, what it means to me is the concept of opposites coming together and in mixing into something it's not only new, but different and more interesting than, than either or both of them just separately. The concept of a, of a gestalt, like um, something becoming more than the sum of its parts. So that is the, uh, the concept that I wanted to, to, uh, to bring to this meeting right now. So, uh, oh, and the intention that goes along with this is what are the, the things that our brain does? What shapes does thinking take? So bringing that question to this concept and vice versa should hopefully give us something that's more interesting than the sum of its parts. Yeah, so that's the intention and the centerpiece for now. Wonderful. Oh, that, I love that visual. Um, would you like me to run through the agreements? Um, or do you want to read, read the agreements uh, yes, while please. I post, post them in the chat? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's do that. I'm just uh, pull these up here. <clears throat> let's see. Uh, before we begin the conversation, it's important to establish agreements that will guide us and protect us within the circle. These six agreements are a starting point for action circles and they belong to the circle. They will be reviewed at the beginning of every circle and any member of the circle can propose additions or modifications. One, while every action circle will be recorded and made public, the stories shared within the circle should only be shared in a way that protects, uplifts, inspires, and empowers others. I think uh, last time we said the, the stories stay within the circle, but the lessons can leave. Let's see. Second one, we listen for understanding and are mindful of how our words and actions impact the flow of the circle. And we take responsibility for addressing any hurts that we may cause. The third one, we know we won't solve these complex problems overnight, and we're committed to learning and unlearning so that we can be more impactful with our actions. Number four, from time to time, we will pause to regather our thoughts or focus. Silent counsel can be called for by any member of the circle by using the chat function. Uh, so you can say things like uh, Gilmo, good enough, let's move on. Or a person speaking can say, waste, why am I still talking? Uh, number five, the chat function is reserved for contributions from those who choose typing as their preferred mode of communication and for gems, quotes that have been harvested by scribes, many of us. Also, if you're all, or let's see, also you are always welcome to pass by speaking out the word by just saying pass or by typing pass in the chat. And number six, whenever possible, we take a pause before speaking and use sound verbal behavior measured and deliberate speech when sharing our perspectives with the circle. Mm 
And so for the introductions, we will have uh, first, we can just introduce ourselves, um, uh, what we do, that sort of thing. Uh, let's see, just brief introduction, land acknowledgement, uh, where we live and, um, and who originally lives on that land, maybe still lives, and uh, acknowledgement of the agreements. And then the feelings question, which is today that's going to be, uh, what is an action verb that you'd associate with your feelings right now? So I'll start the introductions here. So I'm Alex Weisenfels. I am an eccentric existentialist philosopher and high functioning escapist. I, uh, let's see, I live right now in Madison, Wisconsin, originally inhabited by the Ho-Chunk peoples. And I acknowledge the agreements. And action verb, let's see, I'm feeling, um, go with guiding. Uh, right now I'm feeling guiding. Okay, then I'll pass the, the talking piece over to Abby. All right. Thank you, Alex. So my name is Abigail Twyman. Um, you can call me Abby. And um, I'm a humanistic behavioral scientist, creative writer, and data-driven optimist. I am currently living on the lands of the Clinket, Haida, and Simshian people, specifically in where what was the ancestral home of the Tuxican tribe. Um, I, I agree to the agreements as they are stated, and my action word today is sparking. My brain is sparking. All good. All good sparks. And I will pass it to John. Hello, I'm John Kelling. Um, I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I am a father, friend, programmer, thinker. Um, let's see, action word today. Presently, I'm actually very tired because <laughs> I just finished working out for one, and I'm also struggling to figure out what I want to do next almost every day. And it is kind of an exhausting feeling. And I will pass it to, uh, is it Mary? Hi, I'm Mary Wong. I am also in Madison, the land of the Ho-Chunk people. I have my talking piece, which is my triptych of Peking opera and feels very delicious in the hand. It's lacquered. <laughs> um, I'm a mother of two biracial adult children and I am an effective altruism and rationality organizer. Um, I am for more than 40 years a teacher of English to speakers of other languages and an advocate of communication across cultures, however that can possibly happen. And I'm really searching for a verb today, so I think searching is the verb. And I will pass it on to Maximus. Good morning, everyone. This is Maximus. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, so, um, yeah, I agree with, of course, the, um, the agreement and acknowledge the agreement. And, um, I live here in Chico. On, uh, hey, Maximus, I'm going to pause you really quickly. Your, your audio is really garbly. Is that right? I think you may be using a different microphone from the one that you normally use. Is this better? Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was I was wearing this headset and maybe that does something to the system. Okay. So um, as I was saying, um, I live in Chico and uh, this is land of the Maidus and. Um, um, I am a psychology instructor and a self-taught behaviorist. 
and um, the action verb and uh, is uh, making music, making sound, you know? So uh, I played this recorder just before we started. And um, yeah, that's it. Um, looking forward to today's uh, presentation and everything. Yeah, thanks. All right, next up is Nancy. Hello, thank you. Um, so my name is Nancy, I go by Nancy, and I live in Phoenix. Um, the, uh, I live in Phoenix and this land, uh, acknowledgement of this land would be to the Apache, Navajo, among other tribes here in Arizona. Uh, I'm a behavior scientist, an aspiring yogi, a humanist. I acknowledge the agreements that were stated um, previously. And my action verb is becoming, as in becoming what I value and what I aspire. And the next person is, oh, am I the last one? No, I don't see number six. Sorry, can somebody? Sheena. Oh, there it is, Sheena, Sheena, thank you. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Sheena and I live in Tucson, Arizona originally inhabited by the Hohokam Indians amongst uh, probably the Apaches and um, uh, Navajo as well. Um, I acknowledge um, all of the rules for today of the group. Um, I am a behavior analyst currently on vacation from work. <laughs> um, I am a yogi of about 20 years. I am a mom of two, a wife of almost 12 years, and um, I'm an empath, um, altruist, I would say. Those are probably good describing words. And today I would say, I don't want to bring everyone down, but I'm feeling vulnerable and, but excited. Um, so those would be my verbs probably today. A um, little bit tired, but I'm excited to be here with everybody and be a part of what Alex is going to talk about today. And what else did I miss, everybody? Oh, uh, I, that's it. That's it. I think I got it. Did I cover it all? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> hmm, awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Let's see, next on the schedule, we have. Uh, some guided meditation. Not sure, if um, it'd be good to have five minutes, ten minutes. I originally budgeted for ten minutes. If uh, if we need that. Yeah, I'd say. Let's, let's see. Yeah, do we want to take? We'll take five minutes and maybe just have some silent counsel, some silent reflection of um, what kind of thinking back, and maybe we, maybe Alex, you can pop that image back up. And as mm -hmm. you are kind of settling in and breathing deeply and coming into your space, really think about the shapes and maybe just visualizing the shapes that, that come as you think about your thinking or draw the shapes that come into your thinking. And we can just sit and breathe. Shoulders back and down as you settle into this space. Your crown of your head drawing up to the sky, straightening your back and your spine out like the trunk of a tall tree. <clears throat> S 
steady and grounded. Visualize the, the roots of your tree extending down deep into the ground, tapping into the life force that exists within this planet. Reaching up into the sky, connecting the ground to the sky, the opposites. And what is created in that middle ground in you. Allowing the natural rhythms of your breath to just be what they are and just notice. Notice the sensations in your body where you might be feeling some tightness or tenderness. Direct your breath to that spot to release the, ten the tension and ground you in the present moment. As you breathe in, notice the sound your breath makes as it comes in and fills your lungs. And releases out through your, through your mouth, like the sound of the waves lapping against the rocks. For the final two minutes, as we get ourselves centered and grounded and here in the present moment, focus your gaze on your third eye, that spot between your, between your brows, and tap into that visualization. Your visual cortex is sending and just notice the shapes and the sounds and the sights and that you're seeing as you think about your thinking.
together. We're going to take three big, deep breaths in and let them out with a sigh. Not a sigh. Let's do, let's, it's chant at the moon day. Let's make a, whatever noise comes out of your mouth when you open it up and just let that breath out. So breathe in deeply and fill every spot in your lungs through your nose and hold it and then open your mouth and let out whatever comes out. Ah. Breathe in again and fill it up. And open your mouth and just let it out. Ah. And last one, breathe in. Hold and let it out. Ah. As you gently open your eyes and wiggle your toes and fingers and come back into this space, centered and ready to explore the mindsets and attributes that are foundational to our life. That was great, Abby. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> it's all you, Alex. There we go. Thanks a lot, Abby. Let's see. Here we go. The next thing that, uh, that we'll be talking about today here now that we've uh, centered, we're actually talking about the mindsets that we use to deal with problems and just situations in general, mindsets that we approach life with. A bit of an overview. A mindset is kind of a, uh, a thought pattern. It's, it's a way that we deal with the world. And these mindsets aren't they're not um, modules that, um, that are just separate mechanically. They're more like the primary colors that we use to, uh, to paint our approach to a situation. So even though I'll be talking about them as though this mindset does this and this mindset does this, in reality, although people can use them separately, they actually mix together very well. And so the first mindset that we'll be talking about, if I can, let's see, I'm going to be dealing with these pictures here. Here we go. And sure again, it's the mindset that we just used. And there it is. Observation mindset is the picture that I have for it. Observation mindset is kind of the zeroth mindset. And what it does is it absorbs moments. So it takes away all of those, uh, all of those pictures of the world, all of the, uh, the filters and the maps that we create in our heads and just looks at what's going on right now. Uh, what uh, what am I sensing? What thoughts are crossing my mind? What am I feeling? Uh, are there any memories that uh, that are coming up right now? And it it just clears off the workbench of our mind and lets all of these things pass over it without judgment. Just just looking at what there is right now, and so it it resets us and recenters us so that we can decide what's important and, uh, and how we respond to it. That's observation mindset. And uh, ways that we can use it, we can meditate like we just did, clear stress, focus on the breathing and the senses. We can count to 10 if we're upset. All these things and more go into observation. 
see. And then the next one, these mindsets are becoming, well, there's, aside from observation, there are eight basic mindsets aside from the zeroth mindset observation, four primary and four secondary. And so we'll be looking at what sorts of things these do, just a very brief summary of each one. And then we'll be uh, going through what questions people have about those mindsets or just you know, what, what they make you think of, just anything that they remind you of here. And after that, we'll be going over just a few basic attributes that we use to describe how people use these mindsets and, uh, and their, their various, various ways that they can be developed and strengthened. Here we go. Let's go to the next one here. Here we are. This, whoops, sorry, hang on. Hmm. There we go. Oh, well. Um, hmm. I was going to clear out the uh, the names, but just just try and ignore any words on the page. And uh, the slideshow didn't work the way I intended it to here. So there we are. We'll just not worry about that. There we go. So this is operation mindset. Operation mindset is the first primary mindset that um, that we'll be looking at. It's um, it's intuition. Operation is what shapes our effort. So if you practice something enough and you get consistent, immediate feedback, develop a sense of what's going on and what you can do with the situation, even though it, it doesn't actually store the knowledge as to why you're doing it in your head. There's a lot of information that's compressed. And when you've, uh, when you've practiced something enough, you just know what to do. And so as long as you have a consistent situation, that allows you to deal with it very gracefully, uh, just as uh, without, without even really thinking about it. So some examples of this would be uh, athletes, dancers, uh, martial artists, pilots, people who, who craft things, all sorts of, uh, of different things can use observation, or sorry, Operation mindset. I have too many mindsets to start with the letter O. Such as the next one, which is organization mindset. Organization mindset is essentially the opposite of operation mindset. It allocates effort and everything that it does it does where you can see it. it. You have an explicit record of what you're doing and why. So you think of what are all the different things that you want to do, all the different goals you have, and what are the resources and the limitations that you're working with in order to accomplish these goals. And you consider all the different things that you can do with your resources, all the different options for how you can assign them, and prioritize the goals. And you figure out what arrangement of what you have gets you the most of what you want. And so this is, uh, this is used for prioritizing tasks, arranging logistics, managing resources, handling budgets, all sorts of things where details have to be coordinated. See, here we are, and the next one. Next one we have is synthesis mindset. And that deals with generating ideas. It emphasizes the, uh, the process of guessing, explores possibilities. It's our imagination. And so it uses free association to go down all sorts of rabbit holes, starting from one idea, and finding related ideas, 
and finding ideas related to those and so on and so forth and mixing them all together and combining them in new ways. And so people use synthesis for brainstorming, entertainment, things to do. Uh, we use it for creating art, poetry, literature, games, songs, anything to do with, uh, with creativity. Here we go. Next we have analysis mindset. And this one is the opposite of synthesis. And it deals with evaluating ideas. So it emphasizes the process of checking to make sure that things are consistent. Consistent with the reality that we see. We examine the implications of our conclusions to make sure that, that all of our different uh, ideas and beliefs fit together. And so if we have uh, some sort of a mystery and a set of possible answers, analysis can figure out which answers best fit the evidence and which ones are most likely to be true. And so we use this for troubleshooting problems, uh, diagnosing things, uh, forensic examination, any sort of scientific research, anything ending in ology. Uh, history, just figuring out what actually did happen all those years ago. So archaeology or uh, analyzing literature, and in general, figuring out what's going on and how things work. So those are the four primary mindsets, and those those we can actually combine to make more mindsets. So you may be thinking of, uh, of where you see these things going on here. Here's the next one. Semantics mindset. Semantics mindset deals with uh, simplifying interactions. So if you see a situation and you know how it works, it's, it's familiar, then what you do is you combine the intuition of operation and then the process of analysis. And you reach into your, your vocabulary, your lexicon, you take out these labels and you stick labels onto everything in the situation. And then you apply rules, you feed the labels into those rules and you figure out what's going on and what you may need to do. And so it makes it very easy to, to remember things and to tell other people about those things and to, uh, to solve problems that fit a certain theme, a certain formula. And so people use this for mathematics, physics, programming, law, language in general, that sort of thing. I, being uncomfortable with monologuing, I'd like to remind people that it's, uh, if anyone needs me to take a pause, then uh, feel free to do so. I don't want to be um, talking so long that, uh, that people lose me here. I'm following pretty good, but I did have a question. You said, um, you said those are the mm -hmm. four primary mindsets. There were actually mm -hmm. five. Oh, yeah, sorry. I should probably transition this. So that last one, uh, semantics. That is the beginning of the four secondary mindsets. So we, we get that by combining analysis and operation. And uh, the other secondary mindsets will do similarly. There are all sorts of combinations, but right now we're just focusing on the, uh, the most basic ones that people can, can easily recognize. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Oh, excellent. There we go. Let's see. So there's, uh, there's just three more, and then we'll go around the circle here and, uh, and get any, uh, any thoughts that people have on these here. Let's see. Here we go. There we are. Next up, we have empathy mindset which 
is the opposite of semantics mindset. And so instead of simplifying interactions, it individualizes them. This one combines operation with synthesis. So it, uh, it removes all of our labels and assumptions. And it thinks about the different impressions that the events may have on different people. And it can help you influence those impressions while getting a, a better sense of what someone may be like in a particular context. So it helps you navigate uh, situations that change in response to what you do when you can't always predict what will happen. It works on, uh, it works on people most obviously, but there are all sorts of different situations that you can apply it to and deal with, uh, with people. It also deals with, uh, with just animals in general. Uh, you can deal with a temperamental vehicle using empathy. That's, um, I know people often express things that way. Uh, it's even useful for, for dealing with uh, preparing food. It's not something I would necessarily know about, but I'm pretty sure based on how people talk about it, that that's the sort of, uh, sort of way that people can tell how, how to properly prepare a particular set of ingredients, that sort of thing. So I'd welcome uh, people to help me learn more about that. You can do all sorts of things like listen um, to, to help calm people, console people, impress, persuade, even deceive, distract, anything to do with subtlety. All of this can, uh, can be the, uh, the purview of empathy mindset. So this is, there are a lot of different things that you can do with this one. I guess it, it can be the most interesting because it, what interests people is part of empathy, if that makes sense. Hmm. I'll avoid talking too much about uh, any one mindset though here. There we go. And then we have strategy mindset. Strategy combines organization and analysis, and it fortifies paths. It keeps track of what you need to solve a problem. And it looks at all the contingencies and all the side effects that aren't obvious, all of those consequences that, uh, that people may sometimes run into if they don't use this mindset. It sees all of these unwanted possibilities and then it assigns resources to close them. So that, uh, so that we can prevent, uh, we can prevent plans from being disrupted. Uh, we can reduce risk and keep things safe from physical harm. Uh, strategy obviously has military applications, but it's also useful for making robust plans in general. And then lastly here, we have tactics mindset. Tactics mindset is the opposite of strategy mindset and it redirects paths. It combines synthesis with organization to come up with clever ways to rearrange materials at hand to get more use out of them. It's innovative. It, it removes our assumptions about what can and can't be done. And it thinks through all the unlikely applications for the resources that we have. So what people do with this normally, what we do with tactics is we find opportunities and solutions. We repurpose what we have to do the impossible, or at least find something better than the obvious options. Uh, tactics also obviously has military applications, but it's useful for any problem that requires thinking outside the box. And so that that's all of the basic mindsets and just, uh, picture to to go with them just uh, as a, a theme that I use to think about what they're like and what they can do. And so uh, at this point we go around the circle and uh, the question that I'd like to, to ask everyone is uh, what what do these uh, make you think of? Um, do you have any questions or reactions? Just anything um, just First thoughts, maybe maybe you think that they're confusing or uh, or 
you don't know where one might be used. Yeah, first reactions. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex, for um, describing and breaking those all down for us. And I um, put some kind of recaps uh, into the chat for kind of reminders about what they are and the four primary mindsets and the four secondary mindsets as well. Um, I this way of thinking about how we think really resonates well with me because it's a way that we can, you know, that I, I feel that it will be helpful to, you know, a way that I can, I can describe things to people and to help others um, kind of refine their thinking skills. Um, and so, I guess the qu the question that comes to mind to me is what um, what is the importance of ensuring that we can use these skills fluently? And I will pass it to John. Um, I was, uh, I was just trying to, um, I guess, uh, find a way that each of these relates to me as we were talking through them and, um, operation mindset, it definitely like some of the things that I, or one thing I think about in particular with education, um, this is like, you mentioned Kung Fu, and this is operation mindset. In term, well, when it comes to Kung Fu, um, you train to execute things kind of automatically. Um, I mean, the same for like sports and things like that. But it never happens right away. The first time you do things, you always have to think about it. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting to think about these, like back when I was in school, I'd always wonder why things were so hard and, you know, why, like I couldn't get past something or why I hated stuff so much. And sometimes it's, you know, it's like, oh, well, that's because you're in the analysis mindset and you're working your way towards operation or something like that, you know, and, and to give um, just some clarity, you know, kids are extremely bright and i think um sometimes uh i see frustration in kids because or anybody really because they don't know why things are the way they are or why things are difficult or why they don't like something or why they're you know so anyway um i was also thinking i was horrible at organization mindset and then when you went on to synthesis, I was about to say, like, I think I've been stuck in synthesis mindset for like the last 20 years. <laughs> but, um, but then when you got the tactics, I was thinking, um, that's like definitely something that um, I use in software development all the time. And uh, um, anyway, so yeah, I think like, These, I'd like to see where you go with it. Um, I'm just taking it all in right now, so. Guess I'll pass to Mary. So I've often heard Alex refer to these various mindsets, but I've never gotten the whole big picture. So this, that's kind of fun for me. Um, my mind goes where it always goes, which is to teaching. And how do I use this in my teaching? How could I use this in my teaching? And it makes me aware that a large part of what I do is 
recognizing the mindset that someone is in and how that's either helping them or hindering them and maybe in nudging them to shift mindsets so that students often come from their um, high schools with very clear ideas of what it takes to be a success as a thinker and a student and a, just a successful human being. And those are very naive ideas for the most part. And, um, and they're often based in fear and a very carefully structured system around grades. And I think that getting them to shift their mindset I mean, I think in particular of the process of writing a paper, there are parts in the paper where you, when you need to really get into organization mindset, when you've got all this stuff and you see what's in front of you and you don't know what to do with it. But there are other times, and this is the probably much harder to get into an empathy mindset while you're writing a paper and just go okay calm down stop trying to impose structure and just let the data talk to you just let the, what you've read just feel it you know just see what that's that's like so i i don't know i like having labels for these different things and being able to say oh at least in my own mind okay i need to shift this person from this mindset to that mindset that now in order to help them get to the next level with whatever their goal is. And I will pass the talking piece to Maximus. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, these things, uh, these different mindsets, for me, it, it is very um, alien, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Uh, I do not really think in those types of terms, um, although I know that other people do. And um, uh, so that doesn't mean, by the way, that I do not use any of these things. Of course, I do. But um, I guess I refer to them differently than in this descriptive way. And um, yeah, to me, it's all very much part of um, how we how we relate to each other. That sort of um, brings about these different mindsets. Um, I was wondering also, like, if there is. Um, um, you know, when you talk about these different mindsets, if there is a relation between these different mindsets and uh, different learning styles, as they call them. Um, maybe I'm just a simpleton or something <laughs> that I that I think this way, but uh, uh, I um, yeah, I do not. I do not really know so well how to crawl into one of these particular mindsets, so to speak, you know, that, that I find that um, a bit of a challenge. And uh, um, so, but, you know, yeah, maybe you can speak to that. And then I pass it on to, um, let's see who's next. Um, I am. Oh, Nancy. Yes. Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, Alex, thank you for sharing these with us. Um, I think as you're going through all of them, kind of like what Maxima says, I think we, I have used um, some of these without really tack, na labeling them. I was about to say tacting them. <laughs> Be here, um, I, I, what The one that stuck with me, uh, well, it's uh, several, but uh, the analysis portion of it, I feel like I've spent my life analyzing and fact-checking and examining the implications, as, as, as you guys, as you put it, um, about life in general. I think it's served a good purpose to a certain degree. But then um, when, I, when you overuse 
one certain one to apply to other scenarios like you know exploring um, uh, past experiences and just hyper focusing or having like a tunnel vision with just analyzing it and you're like I get it I understand and uh, thinking that you can move on from those experiences only because you can understand them semantically I guess um, and and not allowing other experiences or up uh, sorry other mindsets to be to process those experiences with other mindsets other than the analysis because the analysis is very cognitive, at least in my understanding. I'm sorry if, if it's, uh, I don't know. At least in my understanding, it seems so, um, so uh, cognitive in that you understand it here, but you don't understand it here, or you don't allow it to process here. And I feel like uh, at least in the past couple of months or three, four months, I've been trying to process those experiences through the, um, what's it called? Um, I believe it was the, I'm trying to get the name right, Is it intuition or kind of like the operation mindset where uh, allowing myself to experience emotions um, when looking at past experiences versus just analyzing and thinking, oh, I get it, like I'm good, right? <laughs> and not really um, processing it with all the other mindsets where you can better synthesize, I guess, or better conceptualize your experience um, and you have a, a wider range of looking at that experience versus focusing just on analytical, right? And, and the analytical to me has been like a coping mechanism safe place because it makes sense, right? It's, it's fact, it's factual, and this is the way it is. But just because something is factual doesn't mean that we cannot have emotions attached to them and experiencing them and having a healthy channel for those, for, for that kind of like being, like allowing yourself to have that intuition to feel and not try to say whether it's right or wrong or, or it's right, right, right or not, you know, I don't know. It's just my thoughts. <laughs> but yeah, I, I guess that's, I have to digest it more, but I don't know why that was, um, I guess, based on my life experiences that that's what I was thinking about. I hope that makes sense. And the next person is Sheena. Alex, that was fantastic. And it's a lot to chew on. So thank you. Uh, um, my initial reaction was, um, how organized it is and uh i i am just speaking for myself right now but i i tend to function better when things are organized when i have a when i have um things are organized uh both in here especially in here uh so that uh i can function out here uh more effectively. Um, so my initial reaction was, wow, what a great structure to refer to, to increase self-awareness, but also to guide others. And it sort of, it may, you know, it sort of reminds me of the yoga sutras you know, which are also sort of guiding um, principles for living. And those, those were my initial reactions. And, and my, in order to, t I would love to take a deeper dive into this stuff. And my, I would like to propose a question out to you, Alex, and um, who is very intimately um, this is your thing. I would love to hear more about how do you use these in your life, um, or or what are some some examples in your life for which you refer to these mindsets or that recommendations for us how we can use them in our lives. Um, 
going out. Hmm, let's see. We are a bit ahead of schedule, so the uh, a lot of the uh, the questions of where we use these and where we may want to use these, those we're uh, we're kind of saving for the the next meetings in the action circle. But uh, this um, I can speak a bit as to how I use these. Um, so what here's here's my logo uh, talking thing. Um, the way I use these is. I look at a problem that I'm trying to solve and that I'm I'm stuck on, something that I I find very difficult that I struggle with, and I look at okay, what kind of problem is this? What mindsets does it require? And then I deliberately try and uh, enter those mindsets so that I can better pick up on what is important about this problem and what is not. What do I need to to be aware of and what can I safely just uh, ignore as so I don't get overloaded with information. So that helps me uh, better calibrate. I, I get a sense of, okay, now I can use this mindset in this situation. And so I'm better able to deal with, uh, with the problem. So that's the way I use them. Let's see. We're still ahead of schedule. I think it may be good to uh, to go into the attributes and then we'll have another go around and then maybe we'll even have uh, time for yet another go around. Let's see, here we go. Let's check out the schedule here, uh, excellent. I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna talk about the attributes which describe the different ways that we can develop and strengthen these mindsets and any any skills that we have. Let's see, here we go. There we are. This little goldfish here represents initiative attribute. An initiative attribute deals with the conditions that you require to get started. Oops, sorry. The conditions that you use to uh, to get started. Here we go. Hey, hey Alex. Sorry, uh -huh. I had a question real quick. Oh, yeah. Do you, um, th this is sort of a hierarchy thing too, right? The, the attributes part of mindsets or, or are they gen like different, separate from that? Oh, good question. So the attributes are not mindsets. They are separate. They're a separate set of concepts and we use these to describe the mindsets. They're like, uh, they're like dimensions, um, measurement. Let's see, how would I put this? Let's see. So let's say you have, uh, let's say you have a box and that box can be different colors. Let's say the colors represent the mindsets, but then you can have the box be taller or you can have the box be um, denser or uh, let's see, or rougher, smoother, like just various different dimensions of the box. So that represents the, the attributes. That kind of, I see Mary. Makes sense hand. to me, yeah. Oh, good. And Mary, I see you raised your hand. Yeah, so the attributes don't adhere to the person who's applying the mindsets. They adhere to concepts or problems. Hmm, let's see. Yeah, I'll need to, to make sure that the, the these concepts are, that the general concept type is explained before I get into what all these different things are. So let's see. So the mindset describes sort of a general how you think, your approach to a situation. And then the attribute describes how, describes uh, just how skilled or how well calibrated you are with a given mindset 
for a given situation in a given way. Uh, let's see. The person. The attribute belongs to the person. So a person has initiative? Yes. Uh, yes. To a problem? Is, yes. Is that how the attributes work? They adhere to the person relative to any given challenge? Yes, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's um, so you can develop these attributes and increase your initiative, for example, with uh, a particular problem, a particular skill, a particular mindset. And so you can have you can have people who have high initiative all around, or maybe they have high initiative relative to a specific mindset or a specific situation, that sort of thing. And it describes hmm, trying to come up with a thing about the attributes is uh, it's rather difficult to come up with metaphors for them. They're they're just sort of there. But there are there are plenty of examples that I can go through. Let's see. I guess it might so. work. It makes more sense as you get into it. Yeah, I think so. Maybe we'll just um, we can even just forget the word attributes, and then we can just discuss these different these different words one by one, and then we can see how they all are similar. They they fit into the same set of concepts. Yeah. So, Alex, can I offer up just a, maybe a like a a sentence using the words that might help illustrate? And t you can tell me if this is wrong. So, mm -hmm. for instance, I just said that these are qualities of individuals in relation to specific mindsets. For example, and this is what I might say, she takes a lot of initiative in regard to organizing. Mm -hmm. Would that be like a way uh, exactly. to use those words to describe someone? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Abby. Let's see. Here we go. So we can talk about uh, initiative attribute. Initiative, just initiative in general, describes the conditions and the incentives that you require in order to start something. So it deals with how you relate to your environment. Uh, if a reward for accomplishing something is small, or if the reward is far away, or it's difficult to reach, and you'll still go after it, you still want to, to get started to, uh, to try achieving it. That means that, uh, that for that situation, you have a high initiative. So uh, I sometimes like to think of these in terms of uh, a superpower. Um, you can pick your su favorite superpower, just for the sake of simplicity, I could pick uh, telekinesis or something. And so if you can use it casually, if it doesn't take much energy for you to do it, like, oh, okay, I'll, there's, uh, there's something that's, let's see, there's, uh, I want to grab that mug on the other side of the room, and it, it may be far away, but if, if you can just decide casually that you want to do that, and, uh, and you just reach over and grab it. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be quick. It doesn't have to be very impressive. But the fact that you can just do it when you want, say, decide it and go for it. That's initiative. And so uh, I use a, a verb to describe each one of these concepts. And the verb for initiative is driving, uh, being the the driving force. Um, the the volition to to make something happen. So it, it doesn't have to be a, a giant reward right next to you. It could be far away, and you go after it. So that's why I have this. Uh, this this was the best picture that I could come up with for initiative from from the Pixabay site. It's um, a fish that uh, wants to live in a slightly larger goldfish bowl, and so it makes this uh, this giant leap. To, to get into it here. So figured that's initiative. And next here, the, uh, the opposite of initiative, we have resilience. Now resilience also deals with how you relate to your environment, but resilience deals with 
the conditions that you need to continue to, uh, to persevere with uh, whatever you're trying to do. So the better that you can maintain the quality of your performance under stressful and uncertain conditions. If uh, the conditions of uh, this, this hurricane here, we have some very resilient palm trees and uh, a light post. And so they're, they're still there. They're still doing their jobs. Oh, and there's a building on the right. I've never noticed that. And uh, so these, these are resilient and they describe how well you can, you can keep doing what you're doing and it gets tough, but you, you stay calibrated, you stay poised. So if we're talking about um, the telekinesis example or whatever your favorite superpower is, let's say you're using telekinesis to, to lift a bunch of things then somebody jumps out and, and startles you, or maybe you've been working for, for 16 hours and you're very tired. If you can keep all those things in the air and, and move them where they need to go, that's resilience. So all of these things are, are things that people can, can practice and build up over time. And there's two more basic attributes that we've got here. Here's mobility attribute. And uh, mobility and the next one, these deal with the, the effect that you have on the world. And mobility deals with how well you can start having an effect and how well you can change direction or stop because those are just starting different things. You're just deciding to start the process of stopping. So the more quickly you can start having a meaningful effect, uh, achieve a meaningful result, this doesn't have to be a big one, but accomplish something and wrap it up and move on to the next thing, that's, uh, that's mobility. So the more mobility you have, the better you can do that. Oh, I apologize. I forgot to discuss one thing about resilience. I'm going to head back to that one here. Uh, the verb for resilience is striving. So it, that's the verb that just describes if you're, if you're keeping your composure under stress, then you're striving. And then we're going back to mobility here. So mobility with the, that superpower metaphor, that describes how quickly you can learn something new and apply it and then start doing something else. So just learning things quickly or just changing direction. So if I'm using uh, I'm using telekinesis with mobility attribute, I'm going to be I can move something over there, and then something else comes up suddenly, and I decide, okay, I'm going to to start moving this other thing. Oh, now I have to move this other thing. Oh, I want to move that other thing over there. Just change direction, change what you're doing, without having to to prepare for a long time. Just short notice. And the verb for it is shifting. Just shifting from one task to the next, wrapping it up, shifting, so that uh, it doesn't take a lot of time to, to charge up. And then the last thing is the opposite of mobility, and this is intensity. And it deals with how big of an effect can you have? How well can you can you not only just have an effect, but push the scope of that effect out and, uh, and make it much grander. And so the more, uh, the more complicated a situation you can deal with, or the, the more impact you can have, the more different you can make the results from what the situation was before you stepped into it, the more intensity you have. And so if we're talking about a, a superpower, then uh, for instance, the telekinesis, you can just move huge things. You have a lot of, a lot of force, or maybe, maybe intensity could take the form of complexity. If you can move many things and keep track of all of them, that is another form of intensity. It's just a matter of what sort of, what sort of thing is intense. And uh, the, the verb that I have for intensity is delving, 
going deeper and deeper in a uh, particular direction of a, a change that you're making and pushing that change out into the world. So the picture I have here is a sequoia to contrast with the, uh, the dandelion, which just spreads anywhere. The sequoia takes a much longer time in, um, well, intensity doesn't require a large amount of time, but it usually takes it and it creates something enormous and it, it just reshapes the world to make a giant tree. And let's see. Driving, striving, shifting, delving. Yep. So those are the uh, the four basic attributes, and I use these to describe how people use mindsets. Because I tend to be a delver, and so I'm trying to work on things like initiative and resilience and mobility. Because I, I already tend to be very intense with the mindsets that I use, but I want to be able to to do things even if they're difficult and to keep doing them and to to try a bunch of different things instead of just using the uh the things that I already have although they're they can get pretty grand or maybe grandiose um but the if they're just if they're just staying in one place then that's kind of unbalanced and so that's why I'm trying to get better with the other attributes if that helps illustrate kind of what they're for and how they relate to the mindsets. So with that, um, ooh, we have a, a lot of extra time here, it looks like, as uh, Faster was speaking than I thought. That's good, so let's, let's just go around. I'm gonna ask why I'm still talking here. Here we are. So, uh, Starting with Abby, what uh, what are your thoughts about the attributes and maybe how they relate to the mindsets? Um, <clears throat> I, this was really great, and that's the you know the I love a lot of things about your model and how you have you know, broken down these thinking skills because they really, they really resonate well with me and they tie, I mean, they're all, it's all very behaviorally based, but described in a way that is different than, you know, behavioral scientists are used to talking about things. But I also like, I think it makes, it makes things, makes things more palpable. Like we can, like I can actually like feel like what I can feel what you're talking about. Um, and so I don't know, I don't know that I had a question in, in there, but I just kind of wanted to tact or label, um, <laughs> some of those, um, like those relationships that I was making and I put them in my notes too. But so for the, the initiative, like the, um, the behavioral term that came to mind was motivating operations, right? Like like what is the motivation, the either the establishing operation or the abolishing oper operation, like to like drive what we're doing. Um, and um, resilience, resilience to me, kind of, you know, the, the behavioral concept that I tie, that I tie that to is like um, maintenance and generalization of skills. So maintenance of skills and being able to like, keep doing the thing like you've learned it and you're so like it's so committed to your memory and way of being that you don't have to think about it you can just be strong um and keep acting um mobility the behavioral concept that i tied that to was response latency so your ability and response latency is like the time between an antecedent and the action and so like mobility to me is that like, you know, is it, does it, is it a short response latency? Can you like, you know, is there the antecedent and you can just boom go, or is there a long response latency? Like, you know, you're taking time and just like takes time to like, you know, build up the energy or mo what motivation to do it. Um, and then um, intensity, <clears throat> 
made me think about um, the behavioral term magnitude of like the magnitude of reinforcement. Um, like, and so that like the, the, the stronger the reinforcement or the potential reinforcement, the more intense, right? Or the, you know, I also think of like extinction burst, like the, like the harder that you need to push to get something, if the outcome is really, you know, worth it, then you're going to push harder. So those were kind of, I was just making those connections and wanted to you know, put those out there for everybody else as well. And I'll pass it to John. Um, hmm. Yeah, well, I, I definitely, um, it, it definitely, like the initi um, initiative and resiliency are, are concepts that make a lot of sense to me. And I fight with those a lot <laughs> too, because, um, well, it's, it's just hard, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to learn and do in life that you just won't have initiative for, you know, not even if you just generally have initiative, it doesn't apply to all things all the time. And um, uh, I think it's an important thing to just recognize in life too, because, you know, like if, if you and your, if you, if you have a, if your partner in life lacks the same initiative you do in very key places, you know, you're going to have, a t uh, you're going to struggle with things, <laughs> you know, and, and it's good to find like balance and just know yourself. And, and also I think you had mentioned, these are things that you can practice. <laughs> so, um, and I, and I've been told this too, not in this context, but um, like, I, like I know there's there's I, I'm I'm curious to see what you have to say about it because I've hated everything everybody else has had to say about it which always comes down to time management it's like oh you just gotta get good at time management then you'll then you can accomplish things it's like well I haven't gotten good at time management yet <laughs> there's a lot of things I want to do in life and sometimes it comes down to like micromanaging your your day and just doing things in little chunks and I always struggle with that. And I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, but I know, you know, there's things that I want to do and I can't, I can't, even like, like education reform, you know, or things. Well, it's like, I don't have a time to dedicate lengthy amounts of time to them. Well, the only way that I could ever reasonably accomplish them is to put little bits of time into them here and there, which you're like constantly dealing with um, initiative and resiliency. Like every time you have to start over and it's hard all the time. I don't know. I don't know if there's answers to that, but it's just something I was thinking. Um, I'll pass the Mary. Okay. Um, well, I had some thoughts, I think, that were kind of similar to John's. And then as he was asking these questions, maybe some sort of responses. Um, because when you, when you lay out the attributes, I'm like, yeah, 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 this all speaks to me. The problem is always is it time to be resilient or is it time to initiate something? You know, do I stay with this project that has so many frustrations or where I, um, I'm feeling really frustrated with my lack of progress, but I still feel the goal is important or do I change directions to look for something else? And I'm thinking of someone who's not here today, but it's been the, the last two sessions, who's put a lot of work into a new curriculum guided by students, which just sounds brilliant and amazing, and, and then is running up against actual implementation. And, you know, at what point do you just say, I have given this everything I can give it, and it's not 
I'm not going to achieve my goals. So that I find that tricky. And the same with um, mobility and intensity. I think I tend to go to intensity really fast. Like I'm all in or I'm I, it's just my personal, my personality is, oh, I love this. Let's do that. And then um, that may or may not be a logical or rational decision. And I may then quickly back away from it and calm down and, and try to think about, well, you know, how far should I push this? How important is this really? How are, important is this at achieving like long-term goals? Um, people in the rationality community talk a lot about prioritizing. This is sort of getting to what John was talking about, about um, I think, you know, we see a problem like education and the, the many problems it presents and we think, oh, but I think I have an idea for how this could be so much better. How do I, okay, first of all, I have to be really clear on what I think the solution is. And then I need to figure out like, how do I make these changes actually happen? Um, this isn't, this is such a huge project that it, it obviously is going to have to take like many, many, many small steps. And I think a lot of rationalists would say, choose small achievable goals and then like have a time frame for that so that you're not like, oh God, another year's gone by and I'm no closer to educational reform, but okay, weeks gone by and I did I did post that blog post <laughs> or, you know, or I did contact that person I've been meaning to get in touch with. So that if you have like really small goals that are achievable, you, you make, you start to take those steps toward the bigger goals. Um, and the other thing I think is like to throw back to what, what uh, we started with, which is the different mindsets is if you're finding that, you know, I make these plans and I don't act on them or I don't have time, go back and experiment with the different mindsets that Alex laid out and said, you know, I've been trying to be an organizational mindset and everybody says I should organize my time and that's not working. Go visit empathy for a while. Just put yourself in an empathy mindset and see if that, if things happen for you in that mindset that aren't happening in these other mindsets that you traditionally associate with achieving the, the things that you want to achieve. Yeah, I'm ready to pass it on to Maximus. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, as, um, as you started talking about these uh, attributes, Alex, um, I got a lot more interested and I felt more, uh, it started to make more sense to me. And um, uh, also the pictures that you showed uh, to uh, explain uh, the different uh, uh, attributes, they really spoke to me. And um, in the sense that it, it, it makes me feel like we're talking about very natural things you know, natural processes, a tree growing versus a flower, a wind blowing, a, you know, tornado. Well, you know, you had some of that also in the other pictures. I, I like that, by the way, oh, at the overall presentation that you use a lot of natural environments to sort of just make your point. And I really appreciate that. And I, um, because that, I think that's, and there's a, there's, there's a key aspect in that itself where you know, natural environments, um, yeah, teaches that or something like that. <laughs> you know, like, what is it like to be this strong tree? Keep them, you're getting bigger, you know? And um, and and so, yeah, um, so I felt excited about that. And um, um, also resilience, you know, what you said, and uh, where, where, and, and the, the, the fish jumping out of the, the bowl, makes sense you know at some point something's got to happen you know <laughs> you just take the leap and um um and there is this resilience um where you just hang in there and but you also are 
yeah, you're rooted, you know, you're rooted, you're, you, you're, you're pulling energy up from the ground and you, you know what you're doing also, and you know that in time it's going to get there and everything has its time, everything has its, um, yeah, season, if you will, if, if you want to add that to it, you know, and so I feel very strongly about that natural aspect of also, I really like what you said too, Abby, about the motivation and all the different behavioral uh, constructs that have to do with that. That that sort of also clarifies very much, uh, um, you know, like also mobility. Uh, I was thinking about variability, you know, like behavioral variability that you can have more choices and uh, degrees of freedom, and um, and so yeah. Um, that 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 speaks to me and um um and I, I i really appreciate now all of a sudden also with the what the, what preceded this uh where you talked about a different mindset i will have another look at it uh to sort of just see if i think about a little bit differently now because it it came to me in a sort of way like oh this is all very intellectual and i don't know if i can comprehend all this you know but now it sort of starts to really feel like yeah there's a lot to this and and of course there are all these different aspects of how yeah how the world works of how we work or how we learn or how we come to i don't know to make a decision or how i don't know circumstances uh pressure us and I don't know test us and and we still have to keep going or we got to stay or we have to just say like no let's just give it up <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm going to do something else and I, I guess for me also I feel like I have uh, found in my own life and and due to the things that I've done I've sort of come to what works for me and what what I feel really good about and I have now for some time already continued with that so I kind of feel really like yeah, this works, you know, and and yeah, that seems to <laughs> they have to rethink that or spend much time revisiting that or something. But um, anyways, if good, good, uh, good, uh, good. Uh, also, anybody else, you know, what you say about it, I, I also find it really helpful, Mary. What you were saying also, and and even though we we have problems with this, you know, even though we, yeah, we sort of just go through these processes of. Um, yeah, trying to figure out whether it's worth it or whether it, whether whether we get somewhere or not. I think it's all important, you know, that we make those analysis, and it is important to sort of just get back to the drawing board and sort of say, like, do I want to continue with this or not? And 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 what is it that I want to also put my energy into? So, anyways, um, you're you're all wonderful people, you know, and I really appreciate all of you, you know, for 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 how you, uh, I don't know, the passion that you speak about your topics and stuff. I find it I find it really, I I, I get a lot out of out of listening to everybody. So, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, thank you, Nancy. Sorry. Oh, no, yeah. no, it's okay. Yeah, go. <laughs> I'm getting the rhythm of it. <laughs> um. What, the one that I want to talk about a little bit is that initiative attribute. Uh, I really like how Abby related it to mo motivating operations and thinking about what motivates me. Um, it's kind of tricky, right? Because uh, you think like, oh, this topic is so motivating, but then there's something else that's holding, uh, holding me back. Um, I don't know if it happens um, that based on the behavioral paradigm. Uh, sometimes when you feel stuck and, and you, you can't have that initiative, we, we refer that as escape avoidance. And, you know, it, it's kind of tricky because you might be motivated on one hand, but then also there's something there where you engage in some escape avoidance and not be able to initiate, right? <laughs> Get started on something. Um, and, and I'm thinking, um, what I was thinking about is um, kind of like, focusing on that, whatever motivates you, whatever outcome you're trying to get out of it versus, um, you know, if I don't do it, if I don't initiate, then something like it's bad if I don't initiate it. But that same line of thinking prevents you from initiating. Kind of like, again, on that escape avoidance, um, kind of focusing on the carrot versus the stick in a way. 
would help me be be in or use that attribute more um, and focusing on like what are things that I value and what are what regardless of of that escape avoidance or whatever um, kind of like focusing on like oh but what can come good of this right like relating that to motivate motivating operations and like what what is what are those driving forces and then another thing that I was thinking is um, how, how are those initiate initiating on something and then focusing on those values and um, I was thinking of of uh, the resilience is it the resilience um, no sorry it's the one that was on impacting the world, which one's that one? Oh, mobility. And I was like thinking about what measurable outcomes would I need to have or need to know of to impact the world in a positive way. And I think that that's also hard because, um, you know, you can, you can have a plan and you can, you can make it happen, but then, you know what are the what what how are you going to measure whether it impacted the world and i guess um in my case it's only been people telling me directly like oh you know what you did for my kid or what you did uh for this or a student saying oh this this seminar was amazing thank you like i learned a lot but you know it's kind of it is great but it's unmeasurable if that makes sense, unless I start telling every time that somebody tells me, oh, that helped me out. <laughs> um, but I wonder, I, I'd like to hear more about how we measure. And, and I guess because my mind is so stuck in like, how do you measure that? <laughs> you know, like how, how, do I, how do I know if I'm making an impact in the world? And kind of, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on, on how to measure that or, or, if, or if just it's enough to, have people tell you, you know, like what you did really had a positive impact. And, or, or maybe the measuring can be more in, in systems. Like in, if, you're, if you're creating systems, those can be more easily measured than somebody telling you, oh, this is so cool, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's my thinking on that. Uh, I hope that made sense. <laughs> and thank you so much for, for presenting this, Alex. Sorry, the next person is Sheena. Uh, okay. So, thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts. And, and Alex, again, this is really fantastic stuff. Abby, thank you for relating it to behavioral terms, sort of like, it was like you interpreted to my brain. <laughs> directly. So thank you for doing that. But it's also, um, you know, these are, these attributes uh, are uh, great reference points. Um, and I just kind of want to piggyback off of just other things I'm hearing from everyone. And I would say that, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in the world right now. But, um, you know, there's a thing I wrote down on here, but we are the hardest on ourselves, especially if you're someone who cares and you want to make a change, a positive change. There's a quote, and forgive me, I do not remember who this quote is by, but we hurt where we care and we care where we hurt. Uh, if you think about that for just a couple of minutes, that sort of leads me to when you are feeling the pressure to put something out there to do to take action towards something that you care about 
it is a vulnerable position and you're going to be the hardest you're going to be hardest on yourself so going to something like okay what's motivating going back to these attributes and saying well what why is this important to me so right there that's your initiative attribute um, and what keeps me going well what keeps me going is because i my value again it ties into values what who am i in this world how do i want to be in this world and also i think what builds resilience of course is um pain and suffering you know which we're all familiar with and if you have been able to if you all of us to varying degrees have experienced um, an amount of pain or an amount of suffering and that develops resilience one's resilience muscle and you look back and say yeah, i did that really hard thing or this this really challenging thing um, was difficult to go through but look what i'm doing now and i'm still going and because it's important to me and then the mobility you know um, i think going back to you john i think the place where we have this mobility and intensity you know the effects that you're wanting to have on the world and to what extent uh my thoughts on those are are again um going to mary what mary said is um making them smaller and more digestible we can't swallow the elephant and we certainly can't save the world so if we do one if you connect to your you know your initiative you already have resilience my friend because you've been through some stuff and um the mobility and intensity i think is where you got to bring the kindness toward yourself um and understanding that what is it that i can do um i'll give you an example you know with the edu education thing um you know based off of our conversation from last week um i do have these big ideas and and i'll be honest i was struggling with stuff this morning um because i'm working on putting something out into the world and i'm terrified and i feel like i need a person to help me i need even though i've had so i have all these tools and um I feel like I need, it's like taking the training wheels off and then just flying. Um, but again, having these and then having these mindsets are really wonderful to refer to. Um, and also remembering that even if it's just one foot in front of the other, that is enough and that it's also okay to have the times when you just gotta not do anything to refresh and then come back to these things and you're like all right i'm ready to go um that's all i have Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for for all your thoughts and for for listening to the ideas and, and thinking about things. I hope that uh, that these will help going forward, and we'll be able to explore how they may help in uh, in the next action circles. There will be uh, a lot less talking from me because we'll be focusing on what everyone is going to. Uh, let's, um, I'm going to start that sentence over because I don't actually know where that sentence was going. There'll be a lot less talking for me because in the next action circle, let me go back to the timeline here. Here we go. 
Um, we're going to be focusing on some questions that, uh, that you can ask yourselves about where do I see people using these mindsets and attributes and where do I myself use them in my life to get a sense of, of how you're already using these tools. Because um, as, as Maximus and uh, let's see who said, I think Nancy also said um, that the, you've been using the, the tools. Oh no, Maximus, you said that you didn't think about thinking in, in quite these terms. But Nancy, you said that, uh, that you were using the, the, the mindsets already. And of, of course, because I didn't invent any of these mindsets. People have been using these for, for thousands of years. I just took them all and, and um, labeled them and organized them and put them into a box. And so I guess being able to, uh, to see how you're already using these and, uh, and being able to, to make them your own. Like, oh, I'm using this mindset to accomplish this task and that person's using this mindset to be able to understand ourselves and each other better. That's one of the, the major goals for, uh, for this toolbox here. So that's, um, that's what I'd like us all to, uh, to do during the next week because that's what we'll be talking about during the next meeting. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex, for um, guiding us today. And I'm excited to um, continue this conversation and uh, throughout this cycle. So today we started our conversation on the about the foundational toolbox for life that has that was created by Alex. Um, and, you know, bringing all of these concepts into a box and putting them into a, a form that we that other that people can connect with and use and rather than just talking about these things in theory or in concept or or feeling as though you know well i i am x i am not resilient as a if you're you know kind of moving past thinking of that as like a static attribute and realizing that these are these are skill sets that we can hone and develop and grow within ourselves and also help others as well. We're not, we're not stuck. We didn't come into this world just one way. Um, we have the ability to change. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. And I hope you will join us again next weekend when we take a deeper dive into the toolbox and consider when and where we are using these skills and we see them being used by others. And I look forward to seeing you all next weekend. If you want to hang around for some social time after the recording has ended, uh, we will be here. If not, have a wonderful week and we'll see you next weekend.